My name is Nicholas. I'm a STFA. And in this video, I will show you how to develop a USB PD application, so a sync application to be more precise, using ST toolsets. So in my case, I'm going to be using STM32 CubeID. And for the hardware, I will be using the Nucleo G0 and the TCPP01 shield. So let's get started. The step I'm following in this video are detailed in the application notes AN5418 that is available on our website at st.com. The code I'm going to add can be found in the application notes, but also in the description of the video. To begin, we will open stm 52 cubeid and we'll create a new project. So we'll select a microcontroller MCU, which is the stm 52 G071 RB T6 or RBTX, as you can see here below. So this is a microcontroller that is on the Nucleo G0 board that we will be using. We're going to open stm 52 cubeid so double click on the icon. We will select our workspace directory and click launch. To create a project, you go File, New, and then STM32 Project. In the target selection, select MCU Selector in the part number, type STM32G071RB, and here, select the RB T6, TX, which is the one, the LQFP uh, pin package, which is on the nuclear ball. So we'll be using this one. So press next step. Let's give a name to the project. So stm 42 g 0 underscore USBPD underscore sync, for example, and then finish. In the graphical interface, the first thing we'll do is to enable the UCPD peripheral. To do that, we will activate UCPD1 in a sync mode. No need to select the dead battery because it is managed by the TCPP01 device. So we find you know, the UCPD peripherals here under the connectivity, so in the pinout configuration tab. So open connectivity, select UCPD1, and we will select it as a sync because we want to develop a sync application. And we will not enable this right there, so we'll keep it unchecked. It is mandatory to enable the DMA for UCPD in both reception and transmission. So let's add these two DMAs. We also need to enable the interrupts for UCPD and also for the DMA that we're using. To enable the DMA, you go to DMA settings and then add both RX and TX. Then we'll enable the interrupts. So we'll enable the UCPD1 interrupt and then we make sure that the two others for the DMA are enabled also. When you develop a USB PD application from Cubamex or CubeID, you will need to enable the free RTOS. So for now, you can use the V1, but soon the V2 will be supported. So select the SimSys V1 when you enable free RTOS, and the only thing will change is the heap size. So the total heap size will change it to 5,000 bytes. Let's enable free RTOS. So you can find it under middleware right there. Select free RTOS and then SimSys V1. Now the only thing we want to change, so look for the total heap size. There you go. And instead of 3072, we'll increase it to 5000 bytes. At this stage, we can configure the USB PD middleware. To do that, we activate the port 0, select the PD3 full stack, and select timer 1 as timer service source. Then we'll add one PDO for sync. The PDO we are adding is the default 5 volt fixed PDO. In USB PD, so under middleware, we will select port 0 UCPD1, keep the PD3 full stack, and also keep timer 1 for the timer service source. Now in the PDO, as you can see, we have one PDO, and we will keep the default settings which is the 5 volt fixed PDO. In the stack port 0 parameters, we'll make sure that the first starter packet or SOP is supported, so enabled, and then we'll make sure also that the revision 3.0 has been selected. In stack port 0 parameters, make sure the first start of packet or SOP is supported. 
then scroll down and select the revision 3 instead of revision 2.0. Now let's configure PB1 as an ADC channel to convert VBUS because on our board, PB1 is connected to VBUS through a voltage divider. We will also configure the ADC with the following settings. Clock prescaler synchronous divide by four, enable the continuous conversion mode, overrun data overwritten, and then select the sampling time to the maximum, which is 160.5 cycles, because we use a high value of resistance in our voltage divider. Okay, so PB1, there is a little magnifier located here. Type PB1, and this is where it is. So we can select it as ADC1 channel 9, basically. And we will also enable the AEC to finish configuring it. Make sure that it's selected right there as channel 9. Yes, so that's enabled. And then we will use synchronous mode divided by 4. OK, we will enable the continuous conversion mode. For the overrun behavior, we'll select overrun data overwritten. And then we'll increase the sampling time to the maximum, which is 160.5. We continue with the ADC configuration. So we can rename PB1 as vSense. So this is the pin used for VBUS monitoring. To add the user label, go to GPU settings, select PB1, scroll down, and user label add vSense. To help convert the ADC into millivolts, we can add the user constant for calculation. So we will be adding VDDA appli set to 3300, which is in millivolts, so 3.3 volt. Go to user constant, add. And set it to 3300. OK. In the clock configuration settings, we will run the stm 2 g 0 at its maximum speed, which is 64 MHz from the HSI, which is the internal clock. Very easy task. Go to clock configuration. And here, for the HCLK, which is so the main clock, type 64. Enter. Then, yes. And it found you know, the perfect configuration from HSI with PLL. So running the microcontroller at its maximum speed, which is 64 MHz. To help during debug, we can enable the debug information to be output on a UART. So we will use the LPUART1, which is connected to the ST-Link V2, which can be accessed from the virtual COM port. So we we'll remap the alternate functions to PA2, PA3, because that's the ones that are connected to the ST-Link. And then we'll also enable the DMA request TX, so for transmissions, activate the interrupts, and the rest of the information or the parameters will remain the same. We are going back to the pinout and configuration tab. Look for LPUART1, enable it as asynchronous mode, keep this by default, so the parameter settings, keep them by default. Go to DMA settings, add the transmission DMA, Okay, and then we also enable the LPUART1 interrupt. So here it changed, you know, the three. That's a configuration from the free atos. We will now do the remapping of this. So LPUART1, TX, and RX should be remapped to PA2 and PA3. So to do this, so you can expand a little bit, control and press you know, on the, uh, the pin that you want to remap, and then drag and drop. Control PC1, remapped to PA2. OK, so we have done our remapping. We will now enable the embedded tracer from the utilities sections and link it to LPUART1 we just configured. So scroll down, go to utilities, tracer, ENB, so embedded tracer, and link it to LPUART1. 
we need to activate the tracer source in the USB PD middleware. Select USB PD again and just enable the tracer source right there. To finish the configuration of adding debug information, we will activate the GUI interface, which is used to communicate with the Q-Monitor. To do that, you go back to GUI interface, enable it, and then give a name for your hardware board and also your PD type. Okay, GUI interface, enable it, then we'll give a name for the hardware board, so in my case, Nucleo G0, and here, PD type sync. In the Project Manager tab, we are going to increase the default heap and stack size. So, because we're using middleware like FreeRTOS and also the USB PD, we will increase, so it is recommended you know, to increase the heap size to 0x500, and also for the minimum stack size will be 0x400. So we'll do this in the Project Manager tab. In the Project Manager tab, we're going to increase the heap size to 500, and we can yeah, keep actually the stack size, the minimum stack size to 400, so that's good. Uh, see that, you know, in my case, I'm using, you know, the version 1.4.0, so that's the recommended version to be using, and also using uh, Cube ID version 1.5.0 right there. In the code generator tab, we recommend checking add necessary library files as reference. Code generator tab, so we select add necessary files as reference. In the advanced settings, we will select LPUART as LL, so low layer or low level drivers, in order to save a little bit of heap size. Going to the advanced settings, look for LPUART, so scroll down a little bit here, and select instead of HAL, the LL, so which takes less space, which is more optimized. The rest, we can keep it as it is. We can now generate the code. So once you generate the code, you will see a window like this, like a warning uh, that will tell you that because you're using FreeRTOS, it is recommended to use a different timer than the Cystic because the Cystic is already used by the HAL, so our cube library. So usually in a real application, it will be better to use a different timer for the FreeRTOS uh, like time base. But here, in our case, because it's a simple application, it's not going to have an impact. So we can press OK. We can now generate the project. So to do this, you're going to save you know, your project. And that will, so do you want to generate the code? Yes. And we're going to change the perspective. And that's the warning that I was telling you about. So usually, yes, in a full application, it would be better, you know, to change the time base, you know, for Freertos. But in our case, we can just press yes. Now we're going to add some code to make the application run properly. First, we're going to add some code in main.c in the ADC section. So this ADC1 in the two section right here that you can see. So we're going to add, you know, the code in red as seen uh, on the slide. And this code is going to start the calibration of the ADC and launch the ADC. So let's add this code. The code to be added is actually, uh, so in the description of the video. So I added that, you know, after the description, so you can uh, find all the code to be added. So let's start by the first code to be added. So in this section, right there of the ADC, and we're going to add this code right there. So you see, so all the code to be added is going to be listed in the description of this video. So first section to be added, the ADC. Done. Secondly, we will add code in the interrupt service routines. So in stm 2 g 0 xx underscore it.c. So we only need to add code in the Cystic, and this is for the GUI interface. So let's add this code in red. So let's open the file it.c, located here, core, source, and we're going to look for the section for the Cystic, right there. Okay, so we just need to add in this section right there, this code here. So this is for the GUI interface that we'll use for debugging. Okay, OK, 
Okay, so this is done. Now we need to add some code in the USBPD part of the applications. So in a file called USBPD underscore DPM underscore user. So we're going to add some uh, code inside a function called USBPD underscore DPM underscore get data info. So this is to avoid the hard faults if the distant device asks for sync capabilities. So some code needs to be added. So this is the code in red here. Let's add it. The file is located here inside USBPD uh, location, so directory. And look for, so we said the user one. OK, so this is the one. Then let's look at the function we want to update or add a case and the code. So the code to be added is this case right there. So we're going to add a case to it. All right, and save. That's it. So in the same file, in a different function called USBPD DPM Sync Evaluate Capabilities, we're going to add some code in order to negotiate the first contract. So this is the code in red right there that we're going to add. OK, same file. Look for different code section in this function right there. And we're going to replace the code by this code that is right there. So this is the actual PDO that uh, we added in Cubemax. So it needs to match, I mean, in the graphical interface. So it needs to match, so we're updating it. So this is going to be used for the first contract. Finally, we will add some code to manage the ADC read of VBUS in the USB PD power user file. So we're going to add this code in red right now, and that will be the last part of the code to be added. USBPD power user file. Let's add the include of main.h first. Now we're going to look for the second part of the code to be added. So we're going to replace uh, this code right there. So this needs to be updated. So. We need this one, this code right there. I'm going to add this instead of this one right here. And then save. Build the project. So go here, right click, build. That's great. Our code built with zero error. So this is the board setup we're going to use. So at the bottom, we are using a Nucleo G0 board. On top, mounted, we have this uh, X Nucleo USB PDM1, which has, you know, the TCPP01 device on it. So I configured it for the STM32 G0 Nucleo board. So as you can see, the configuration there in red. The X Nucleo USB PDM1 embeds the TCPP01 device for USB Type C protect ports. It provides VBUS power path and protects USB ports against EMC and high voltage surge. So this is how the assembly looks like. At the bottom, we have the Nucleo G071RB. On top, the X Nucleo USB PDM1. So this is my setup right here. I have the Nucleo board at the bottom and on top, we have this X Nucleo USB PDM1 where we have the TCPP01 device that is on board. So this is used, you know, for protection. And also the shield has, you know, this uh, Type-C connector that we can use. Right there, I have my uh, USB PD source. So I'm going to basically program the code that we just, you know, developed and uh, that we added the code to, that built. I'm going to load the code and make it run. And then what we'll do is we'll connect also using the USB PD monitor, USB PD. We will check the trace and check, you know, that uh, the transactions are correct within there. So because we're going to use the trace that we enabled. So what I will do is at some point, I will connect this to here and see what uh, is going to happen on the UCPD monitor. We can now load the code. Now that our board is connected to our computer, uh, we can uh, debug as and then STM32 application in order to load the code from CubeID. Once the code has been loaded, we can exit CubeID and then we'll use another tool called the STM32 Cube Monitor or the UCPD Monitor in order to look at the trace. 
So this is the tool that I'm showing here, right there. So that's how it looks. So it has a trace menu on the right hand side, and we can look at all the transactions that happen between the source and the sink. And basically, we're going to connect you know, to the board, and we're going to check once I connect the USB uh, cable, so the Type-C cable to the source, we're going to look at the different transactions and make sure that the transactions are correct. This is the SCM32 Q-Monitor UCPD. You can find this tool on our website at st.com. I can now connect to my board. So this is the board, remember, the hardware board version, so Nuclear G0, and the PD type that we have uh, configured before. So to connect to it, double click. We can now open the trace by clicking here on traces. I'm going to expand a little bit so that we can see more about the trace. Now I'm going to connect the USB Type-C connector to my USB Type-C power delivery source. And this is a success. As you can see here, all the transactions are correct. So we have a good CRC. We have, you know, like good transactions between the source and the sink. And basically at the end, we have the power state that is ready. So the five volt that has been delivered to the sink as we requested. If you want to find more details about how to do a USB PD sync applications, you can refer to the application notes AN5418 on our website at st.com. So it will retrace all the different steps that we follow today and gives you more information. Thank you very much for watching.